Faithful Politics listeners. This is your faithful host, Joshua, or as they say in Hebrew, Yeshua. Yeshua. Can you say that with me, Will? Um, that with me, Will. That with me, Will. <laughs> 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 and uh, this is, we have on the show today, uh, Professor and Dr. Lawrence Cahoon. He's a professor of philosophy at the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester. It's not Worcester, right? You get no, like, definitely you not. get like drawn and quartered for saying Worcester. Um, no, there. just, just shun for the rest of your life. <laughs> Just shun. That's good. So Professor Cahoon has been on our uh, show before, and we're going to have fun today talking about communism. Everyone's favorite subjects, communism, socialism, and, and capitalism. Uh, it's small topics that I just wanted to throw at uh, at Lawrence today. Lawrence, thanks for being on. How's it going? Uh, fine. We're doing fine up here. And you're yeah. in the midst of a probably a beautiful Virginia spring. We are. It's absolutely gorgeous today, actually. How, how's the weather there in, in Worcester? Well, as I was telling Will, it's it's okay today, but we had a freak snowstorm yesterday. Uh, this oh. is that's a little late even for us to have one in April. So, uh, but it's it's warm enough that the snow didn't stick. So it was just ugly the last two days, but uh, we're okay. <laughs> we needed the rain. We needed the Good. we needed the moisture. So. Absolutely. Well, thanks for thanks for being on again. We uh, it's a pleasure. So we can just jump into it. Um, we so of course we have a lot of different people that listen to the podcast and watch now on YouTube. And um, I guess what inspired me today is originally I wanted to do a series, and I talked to Will about doing a series on like money in April, like in honor of taxes, but then they screwed it all up and said, like, what is it, May or what is it now? I mean, who knows June, I like, think. Yeah. whenever you want to finish, I guess. When has the IRS ever said that? Whenever you want to get done, just get it done. And then. Yeah. Well, the, there used to be a saying that said, you know, the only two things for certain in life are death and taxes, but now it looks like we just have death. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad there's something to be sure of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we need that certainty in life. But kind of what inspired me on this is like, so we are going to have another professor that's going to come on, um, uh, Ramon de Janeiro, I, I believe is how you uh, pronounce his last name. I will know by the time we actually interview him. But he was on the Great Courses, um, which is where I got introduced to you. Um, and he did a he, he did one on globalism versus nationalism. He's got a course on there. And we're thinking about economics. So, um, of course, I know that your expertise isn't in economics per se, but this kind of philosophy that you've talked about in your course on the great courses in the modern intellectual tradition, where you um, go through it's a it, it's an awesome um, an awesome lecture series that I recommend to anyone um, just to help you understand where we're at, like what's brought us even to today in terms of political philosophy. Um, and it was, it was, you have two, you have the modern intellectual tradition and then you have the political, modern political tradition, modern political tradition. Um, and they're both excellent courses, but we wanted to kind of talk about the idea of communism and, and socialism or that kind of spectrum that's there versus capitalism. Because today, like Every time I look on or, or I hear like um, like I watch this Republican um, uh, uh, representative kind of dr dr drill Dr. Fauci the other day and say, our liberties have been gone forever. Then when are you going to let our liberties come back? And basically you're socialist. And uh, he didn't actually say that. But <laughs> um, but all the time I hear the left. They're socialist, the right, they're fascist, Antifa, right? What do we, I guess my first question, just to, just to give you a, like, you know, a softball is what, what are we talking about when we're talking about socialism, fascism? I mean, we throw those words out, but what, what do we really mean? Like what's going on right. there? So let me just uh, qualify what I'm going to say by, um, 
by reminding you. Right. So I'm not an economist. I'm I'm a philosopher who sometimes does political philosophy. Yes. And also I'm I'm old. So I'm my my context for understanding these terms uh, was formed back in the you know post World War II era. Um, and right, the way those terms are thrown around today, I wouldn't know what in the world they mean, the way people throw them around. So, you know, I, let's just say in, in my perspective, uh, in the 20th century, you had this thing, which we could, let's say, called liberal Republican capitalism, the thing democratic capitalism in the Western world. And then it became confronted by two opponents. Two groups ran off in two directions because of the crises of the modern liberal capitalist system. They ran into either communism on the far left or fascism on the far right. Okay. Um, I don't want to be too, well, you asked a simple question to start. I mean, you acted like it was simple. (laughs) Um, So I'll give a relatively simple and perhaps not very careful answer, which is there's almost nobody in America who is either a fascist or a communist. I mean, the United States just, the things people call fascism are not fascism and the things people call communism are not communism. So, I mean, socialism is a milder term uh, than communism, but so you, you establish kind of the, the, the far off positions in communism, you actually have to abolish private property. I mean, abolish all private property. Hmm. Um, that's what Marx said. Um, and that means, uh, all economic activity is under the control of the community as a whole. In practice, that pretty much means the government. And, um, it's very hard to find anybody in favor of that point of view in this part of the world. At the other end, fascism, now here we get into a complication. These are both economic and political categories and the economic spectrum and the political spectrum don't exactly line up. So for example, you people would normally say, you know, fascism is to the far right. I don't know if you're mirroring. I don't know if you're mirroring me or not. But anyway, I think this is your yeah, right. That is right. Okay, good. <laughs> so, uh, fascism is far right, but fascism in some ways resembles a kind of modest socialism. They, the, there's, you know, the Nazis called themselves national socialists. So, right. in in either case, what you have is highly enhanced government control of individual liberty and economic uh, processes, okay? Um, And most of the people arguing, in my opinion, about these things are in fact arguing about relatively smaller moves from left to right in the middle and calling it by extreme names. I mean, that would be my, that's my first take yeah th- that, now we can go into okay. the details but that's yeah I, i'm i'm curious so, so like on that in that same vein um are there things that you see kind of in society that are like you know socialism light or you know or fascist light or adjacent you know like like i'm thinking okay eminent domain is that is that like communism light and is uh, social security you know, socialism light. Um, Let's start with the second one. So uh, another little bit of history here. So um, let's just say, roughly speaking, that in the 19th century, 
the American economy was roughly characterized most of the time by what's called laissez-faire. That is, let it go, let it happen, meaning government played a minimal role in the uh, management of the economy, minimal by today's standards, okay? Um, that doesn't mean it played no role. There's no such thing as you actually, one of the questions is, right, there is no pure, I don't know what pure capitalism means. In other words, with um, one of the, Anyway, let's. I'll try to stay on track. So the, the 19th century, let's say laissez-faire. In the early 20th century, two things happened. Uh, capitalism in the West, Western Europe, and in England and the United States, did indeed start moving a little to the left. That is, more government involvement. This started in America with the progressive movement in the early 20th century. Yeah. And it was mirrored by similar movements in other West European countries. At the same time, whereas in the late 19th century, pretty much anybody who was a socialist who believed that capitalism should be totally ripped down, you know, this was a minority party, socialism. There were revolutionary socialists in a bunch of countries. They were inspired heavily by Marx. Who, who was not the first socialist, but he was the he his theory became the big major form of socialism, and it was an extreme form. Just as capitalist countries started moving a little to the left, socialism started developing milder forms. In other words, there were the offshoots of the communist parties in Germany and elsewhere in Europe started saying, well, and actually I was just I was just reading about this the other day. Communist parties in Europe started saying, well, you know, gee whiz, uh, the, you know, capitalism doesn't seem to be destroying itself. In fact, it seems to be improving the lives of workers. So maybe we shouldn't destroy it, we should reform it, okay? So in other words, both, you know, sort of laissez-faire capitalism, just let the market do whatever it does and don't interfere, on the one hand, and then the radical communists, a bunch of them started moving back toward the center. The result is, ever since the 1920s and 30s, We've got a mixed system that has higher government control. So from a point of view of capitalism, there absolutely is much more government control of the economy than there used to be. But it's also true that the, the things people call socialism inside capitalist countries are not what socialists used to want. I mean, in other words, it's much milder. So, OK, mm -hmm. fine. Let's go back to so Social Security. Social Security was one of the programs. I mean, it started really with the progressives like Woodrow Wilson and Teddy Roosevelt, who was a progressive. Um, and then, of course, after when we got to the, Ro the Franklin Roosevelt uh, administration, a big, a new sort of welfare state um, work fair got created. And then it got boosted again in the 1960s under Lyndon Johnson. So, yes, Social Security, which is like retirement insurance, unemployment insurance, right. and other, the eight-hour workday, all that stuff popped up between about, nine, between the First World War and, you know, the and 1950. All, all that. And so, yes, if you want to say... There's nothing wrong with saying that's a little bit of socialism, but it's not enough to be real socialism. On mm. the question of eminent domain, eminent domain, I don't know legally when it started, but it's been around for a long time. So, right, um, government, there have, I mean, I would put it this way. There have always been limitations on property rights. 
there have never been totally unfettered property rights. The question is what, how much limitation? And hmm. eminent domain, I don't, I don't know constitutionally when that, you know, I don't know when it started, etc. But uh, I would imagine it's pretty old. So, I this is making me think. Like, so when you said you had, there's an, a difference between economic left and right, and then like philosoph, ph- philosophic, uh, political, and, political, and political left and right. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you say is that okay, socialism um, kind of almost encapsulates both communism and like and fascism are parts of the socialism, which is more government control of the markets. Mm-hmm. And then on all the way on the other side of the spectrum would be capitalism, laissez-faire, completely markets dominate, zero regulation. So it's almost like when people are saying, oh, they're fascists or they're social, like it's almost like they're just talking about, well, everything's in the socialism one, just the left and right of that. One one way to do it, one way to do it, and um, would be imagine a horseshoe, okay? Or an, an upside down U, a capital U. So imagine a horseshoe. Now, if you put sort of, liberal capitalism right in the center, like at 12 o'clock, okay? Let's say you got democracy, you got individual rights of all kinds, all kinds of individual rights, including a capitalist society with a, a, a great deal of property rights. And the economy is capitalist, which essentially means both you got a high degree of property rights and Economic life is determined by private contracts between individuals. And prices. Correct. Because that's what leads the contracts, the price mechanism, right? Between supply and demand. That's what Adam Smith said in 1776 in A Wealth of Nations. All right. So you got you got capitalism. You got, you know, I would say you have three things. You have capitalist economy. And that's underneath a politics that's both democratic, which means majority rule, and liberal politics, classical liberal means the the Bill of Rights. Classical liberal means there are limits on what government and the majority can do to any individual. That's liberal, classical liberal. Gotcha. Put that right in the middle at the top. Doesn't even mean it's better, but it just means it's there, okay? Sure. When you move to the far left, um, or the far right, you're moving away from that. Both ends move away from that. You need greater government control in each case, okay? Um, So... The, the, the leftward movement of communism is right. The extreme form would be uh, real Marxist communism, which has not quite ever really existed, um, but forms of it, you know, things, attempts have been made where um, there, are, there are essentially no property rights or no property rights that can't be abridged by government. Um, where all industries are taken over by and operated by government, okay? Um, in, a, in a communist society, that's relatively true. In fact, there's, uh, I don't know if this helps or doesn't help. There's a great story. Um, there was a New York Times reporter many decades ago named Hedrick Smith or Hendrick Smith, maybe. And uh, he was traveling in uh, Siberia, uh, visiting, like, he he was the Russian reporter for the New York Times. And he was out in Vladivostok or someplace way far from, you know, Moscow and Petersburg. And it was when Nixon was forced to resign. Hmm. 
uh, in the early 70s. And um, he was being, you know, there's always some guy, a guide who was also a security man who's carrying him around. And but, you know, a pleasant fellow, but who is there to make sure he doesn't do anything he's not supposed to do. And the morning after it was announced in Russia that uh, Nixon had resigned, the uh, his his minder, his security guard said, listen, I'm very sorry to hear. You, I assume you're going to be recalled now. And and uh, and Smith said, it's got nothing to do with me. And he said, well, the New York Times is part of the American government, right? I mean, you're, you know, your your leader has resigned. Now, uh, the new leader will put his new boy into the New York Times, right? Won't that? Ha- no, 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 no. The institutions are actually separate. Man, that's funny. Yeah. Anyway, hmm. but that ended yeah. in 1989. Now, Go ahead. Well, I was I was going to say I I I feel like we probably should have started this conversation first by kind of establishing a baseline on on what like how how you view America's um system you know mm-hmm. like you know if if you could if you could sum it up phrase it is it just a uh, you know a, a a pure capitalistic society is it a hodgepodge is it like a cacophony of all kinds of different it's a, well one way to describe it is it's a mixed economy OK. And it has been ever since at least the Second World War. OK, so I mean, it, it, since the New Deal, I mean, the New Deal was the great achievement of the left in trying to introduce socialistic elements into the American system. OK. Mm-hmm. Um, but so that's true. We're in a mixed economy. Um but I, right, my point of view here, and part of this is perhaps just being old, um, from my point of view, right, if America is not capitalist, then nobody is. Um, so in other words, compared to all other economies, I mean, it used to be the case that you could say uh, the, most, the most capitalist societies on earth were the United States and Hong Kong, but not, that's not true of Hong Kong anymore. So... Uh, in other words, in terms of the relative freedom of markets, which from my point of view is always a matter of degree. It's always a matter of degree. The United States has a, a, is a free market economy. Um, you, that doesn't mean everything's hunky-dory. From one point of from from one point of view, you could certainly say, "Yeah, but we've gone too far to the left." Well, maybe so, but but there is, or and at various times, people think we've gone too far to the right. So, for example, I mean, to put this simply, um, as long as Look, this is not a socialist society as long as the major corporations in the banks are not owned and operated by government. It just isn't. Um, that's that's not so, so any socialist worth his or her salt would be disappointed <laughs> in that society. Now, again, it's a matter of degree. In the West, let's say, although this applies to many countries now. There are countries that have like a bigger welfare state and a different kind of welfare state, like what's often called the Nordic model, like Sweden. Mm-hmm. So the Northern European countries tend to have a cradle to grave kind of welfare provision, which goes to everybody regardless of need. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Are they socialists? Well, what they're typically called is what's called democr- uh, social democracy, meaning about as close to socialism you can get while still being democratic and having some private banking where you can start your own business. And there's still capitalism going on, but it's 
got a big floor under it and a lot of government intervention. Okay. Then you go to like Western Europe and it's less of a welfare state. Then you come to England and then the United States. And the United States is always has a smaller socially. It's less. In other words, the, the amount of freedom and risk in the American economy is typically always larger. So, yes, we're to, if you want to think in the directional terms, we're right. We are a mixed economy a pretty free market economy as things the, these things go in the world. Um, we are, but, and we're to the right, that is freer market than most European countries would be comfortable with. They're more mm. socialistic, so, not all, but more so. And then, <clears throat> okay, I'm go ahead. I don't no, know no, if this, this is, this is I don't so know if helpful. I'm getting to the key point. It's hard to do this without a diagram. I mean, the, it's, it's, it's a lot <laughs> easier. It really, cause it, you, you need to sort of visualize how these things no, I uh, totally together. Get what you're saying, but what I almost see it like, okay, at the top here or near closer to the top, you have, maybe it's like at the top of the graph, if you think about a graph, you have government control. I mean, not government control. In the bottom, you have government control. Right? And then okay. to the left and right, you have... That's kind of maybe where I'm still unsure as to what the difference is between, like, say, communism and fascism to the left and right. Okay. Well, you're, you're, what you just described is very compatible with the horseshoe. Yes. Because the horseshoe operates in two dimensions. I mean, two yes. directions, right? Two axes. So, right, when you, if liberal, if the relatively least, just say relatively least, you know, the, the right. relatively freest economy and society, you Free can rights, go. Free rights, individual rights. Correct. Absolutely. Property rights. property rights are a huge part of that. Yes. Yes. They're a huge part, but not the only part because there's other rights too. So, but that they, those came into the world together. In other words, property rights, capitalism, and liberal freedoms of the individual to say what they want, worship as they wish, all that stuff came together as a package in the 18th century. Okay. Right. And then progressives are people who kind of said, in effect, yeah, but the, all those other rights, like free speech and religion, don't matter much if you're poor and you can't get a job or if you're old and disabled. So we need a welfare state because that's not freedom, right? And then basically society kind of agreed with that. And gotcha. the game ever since has been how much? How much on each side? In other words, the... Um, for government to interfere in the economy for the good of certain classes of people, or maybe for a lot of people, that definitely restricts liberties, both economic liberties, right, and it and other liberties. Okay, so I mean, you know, the law against heroin, okay, restricts my individual liberties. Right. I mean, there are libertarians are people who want the absolute minimum. You could if you wanted. If you want to say libertarians are a tiny group of intellectuals sitting at the top of that point. <laughs> OK, they're like pushing liberty as far as possible. OK. Um, and what was I going to say? So if, if libertarians are are at the top anyway. Yes. So historically, the real, the big difference between actually communism and fascism in the 1920s was one was international socialism and the other was national socialism. In other words, the, the, the reaction of the Bolsheviks was like good Marxists, we're going to tear, we, the, the Marxist point of view says, and the original one says, 
all that matters is class. All that matters is class. I don't care about the differences between countries. I don't care about nationalities. That's true. That was their view. That's why the Bolsheviks immediately took Russia out of the First World War, because their attitude was war from the communist point of view in the First World War. The First World War was just the French capitalists fighting the German capitalists, fighting the British capitalists. What do we workers care about who wins? They're all evil. It's not a right. national. So communism is supposed to be, in theory, deeply against nationalism. Nationalism doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what country you live in. What matters is you're being oppressed by the property owners above you. Okay? Mussolini and Hitler were all about we must restore the greatness of our nation. The nation is the centerpiece of our existence. Now, to do that, they had to also introduce a degree of socialism. Typically, what they did was what you might call state capitalism, which was you don't destroy property rights. So that's a real difference. Fascism doesn't say everybody's got to give up their property and all this kind of stuff. But what they do is the government gets down and sits in a room. On the one hand, the government sits, you know, a minister sits in a room with the 50 biggest producers in some industry and says, here's what I want you to do. And so they tell, they push the economy one way or the other. And of course, on political grounds, they can take away your property if you're disloyal. Hmm. You follow? So fascism, um, fascism is socialist to a degree. Whatever works, in other words, from, from you know, uh, Mussolini is perhaps easier to talk about than Hitler because Hitler has the, you know, utterly racist anti-Semitism. Mussolini is a little different He's more pure and just a fascist. So from Mussolini's point of view, Italy is the meaning and point of our lives. You know, if a major corporation is making money for Italy and making and and producing our armaments, we want them to keep making money. But if a major corporation isn't doing what we want, we'll destroy it. So it's all about loyalty to the government in pursuing the national destiny. Whereas in communism, it's about reforming society from the ground up, destroying private property. But both of them. It's just about. Yeah. Yeah. Because actually, I mean, in the literal sense, in communism, private property is an evil. Okay. Mm. But. You gotta. You have to spend a lot of time to find somebody who actually believes that. You follow that? It's, it's quite extreme. Yeah. Just like to find someone who's really a fascist is hard. Mm, wow. It's really yeah, yeah. hard. I mean, you you'd have to get. Um, it's very hard because that also fascism also means you give up all your individual liberties to the government. Right. It still means that. It still means that. So people, people on compounds, you know, in Utah uh, or, you know, in Montana, ho- you know, hoarding assault rifles and saying, don't mess with me and don't come on my property. They're not fascists. They may be wrong and bad, but they're not fascists. <laughs> fascists would say, fascists would say, Government, come, represent my soul, and I'll serve you totally. And that's not <laughs> – and you can't find an American – it's hard to find an American who ever, would ever say that, in my opinion. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, I agree. What, 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 what do you think is, is like the biggest um, like influence or influencer to like change you know, this – this political um, or socioeconomic 
like ideology? I mean, like, is it does does like capitalism breed sort of more fertile ground to to you know like dabble in socialism, or does you know communism provide you know sort of the might or the will for people to want to have a capitalistic society? Like, what's what's your opinion? Well, the way it looks is so um, capitalism grew up really kind of in the eight, 17th and 18th centuries. 1776 was the first complete theory of it. That's Adam Smith and the wealth of nations. Um, capitalism, capitalism by its nature changes traditional society. A traditional society enters traditional societies are not capitalist they they have in them little marketplaces where people trade goods but in traditional societies people don't capital so the way paul samuelson the econ, the economist would put it is throughout all of human history economies were ruled by one principle tradition which is Everybody does what their parents did. I mean, the boys do what the father did, and the girls do what the mother did. Uh, almost everybody is a subsistence farmer to begin with. I mean, at least once agriculture was invented. Um, there are no technologies to buy that are going to tremendously change your style of life. I mean, having more money means you have lots of food in a nice house. Um but land, Marx was right about this, throughout this whole period of human history, wealth is basically how much land you own because land produces food and that's the big thing. So only when in the 17th and 18th centuries, when, I mean, to simplify it, when there started in Central Western Europe and then in the United States, a whole class of merchants and traders who start who before they were just you know selling furs from one place to another and or they were artisans who were making shoes they were cobblers and they made their one pair of shoes every 3 hours and sold it and etc but starting and this is what adam smith talked about starting in the 17th 18th century it's discovered that whoa if there was a thing called a bank from which I could get a loan, I could hire 50 people, each of them to do one little part of the task of making a shoe. And the result of hiring 50 people, each of whom does one little task, I make a huge amount of shoes, more shoes. In other words, it's not just a simple multiplier. I make more shoes than anyone can imagine. And then I will make all the shoes in this town and I will make a huge profit. The price of shoes will actually go down. This is Adam Smith talking now. Um, capitalism was a tremendous engine for producing goods at lowered cost to a larger number of people and employing a lot of workers off the farm. And that changed society. And a lot of those changes were very harsh and nasty. In other words, there are a lot of people who didn't like the fact that the world was getting turned upside down by capitalism. Capitalism created problems. And Adam Smith foresaw this. He said, look, cap this thing called the free market, it's going to revolutionize the world because only then will people of average means be able to afford better products at a low cost? That's what, that's what he said. So it quality, will bring the quality of life goes up. Correct. His, the, the phrase that Smith uses, he did not justify, he's not a politician. He did not justify the free market in terms of individual rights, even rights to property. He justified it in terms of, we will raise the level of opulence of society. People will have more to eat, more to buy. It all They'll have good stuff. More good stuff will be affordable by a larger group of people. Okay? 
And uh, he was right. Anyway, after that happened, so I, I, I'm sorry, I have a tendency to drone, but drone on here. But so no, it's okay. You're you're fine. <laughs> the the, tradi- the traditional way of organizing an economy was simply tradition. Everybody does what they do. How many shoes do you make this year? Well, how many I made? How many I made last year? Everything's the same. Nothing much changes. Capitalism comes along and says, no, you can revolutionize the methods of production, and it's a good thing to do. It's a good thing for the capitalists because they will get rich. But it's also good for society because they'll be able to afford stuff that was in incredibly short supply before. Okay. Then the third way of organizing society was invented. That's socialism. And socialism was invented as a reaction against capitalism basically saying, no, we don't want the big property owners who own the means of production to dominate society. We want the people together to dominate society in some kind of way. And that turned out to be, in effect, government or a command economy. They command as opposed to free market. Hmm. Okay. And yes, we have a mix of both. We have a mix of both. And um, I don't want to take a position here, but I will I will say this, and this is, I say this at the end of that course. Um, the urge or need for more or less government intervention, in my opinion, is a pendulum which will always swing. Mm. And part of it, and part of it depends on people's attitudes and what they want. But part of it also depends on just the technological conditions of modern society, which put greater demands and, and um, uh, let's put it this way, by all means, um, conservatives or libertarians who believe that we have too much government, taxes are too high, uh, too many regulations on individual life and all that. That's fine. But in reality, they would never want to go back to the 19th century, a 19th century level of government involvement. They couldn't because Nobody wants a nuclear power plant to be unregulated. It's true. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. If government tries to regulate my barber, yeah, I think that's kind of ridiculous. Okay. But not, but, <clears throat> but not if there's a technology which could have tremendous impact on all sorts of people, then I probably do want it regulated. So, the modern world has a lot of stuff. It's different than in the 19th century where everybody lived on their yeah. own subsistence farm, ate their own food or their neighbor's food. We're not you know? as interconnected. Oh, I mean, we are, we're more interconnected than when they were back there. So vastly more. What we do, what we do affects more people. And so if I want to build like, let's say I want to build like my own strike drone, where I can go and put <laughs> missiles on it and stuff like that. Like, hey, th- it's my freedom, right, to do that. But you're like, no, because this isn't like you have a shotgun that maybe if someone gets on your 10-acre property or like 100-acre property that, you know, you can maybe shoot. It's like you can sh- take this drone and strike all these people. It's like your ability to do vastly more damage to vastly more poor affect more people requires regulation. In my opinion, yes. I'm not even saying it's good or bad, but I'm saying it's inevitable. In other words, the very people who want less government regulation, that in other words, it's not just that people on the left have gotten a bigger voice. It's a res- in part a response to complexity of life and, as you said, interaction. Um, hmm. which is at a whole different level than it used to be. So anyway. Yeah. I mean, I mean, when you can go on Facebook and you can, and you can for all, I mean, 
you can essentially go on to a social media platform and plan a coordinated riot or plan a coordinated what whatever it is like we're dealing with a different a different reality than than we've had right. to deal with before right so you know i would say for those concerned about the size of government and individual rights and you know the intrusion of you know, distant bureaucracies into their everyday life. I mean, I'm very sympathetic to that, but the task is usually to figure out how does the social group manage this problem without restricting individual liberties? And, you know, as Americans, we're always looking for that solution. But, you know, it's not the case that the solution can just be you know, I don't know. Let's go back to uh, Andrew Jackson size government. It's it's not going to happen, and it it pretty much can't happen. Um, in in your opinion, what, what what do you think has grown faster up into the right, um, like individual liberties or or government, um, you know, control? What, what could you ask that again? In a yeah. So way? so so. In your opinion, like, do you think the rights of Americans, you know, have have grown more, say, over the past, I don't know, 100 years or so? Um, or do you think government control has grown faster? Um, so and if it were a race, you know, between liberty right. and, and government oversight, like who would be winning, I guess? Right. That's an awfully good question i really wish you hadn't asked um <laughs> I, ha I don't know that's a nasty question um so uh but uh i wouldn't boy that's a tough one right they've both advanced a lot so you know my lifetime you got the trade-off of like an end to actual legal segregation <laughs> okay not <laughs> any sort of no atmospherics just no you can't come in here uh and the cops will take you out so i mean you you that's freedom okay that's an increase <laughs> in freedom obviously americans after the 1960s there was this sort of explosion and it wasn't just it might have been led by people on the left but then everybody did it i mean in other words, people on all the the bounds of speech in terms of how you can speak, the movies you can see, um, uh, women flooding into the public realm. And, you know, there's nothing weird about your daughter saying, no, I don't want to marry the guy down the block and have kids right away. I want to go be a doctor. I mean, that's not weird anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so, right. There's a tremendous increase in individual liberties, and at the same time, a tremendous increase. And you probably have to combine, on the one hand, government, but there's also this more and more corporate intrusion, yes. right? So more and more buying a service from a corporation ends up having a lot of strings attached. Right. Mm. Like, yes, you know, I, I buy a service, an Internet, I buy a computer. Suddenly somebody's tracking everything I do to try to sell me stuff. Mm. And I, you know, and it's so availing yourself of the technological advances also by a perfectly rational logic. The 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 corporation providing this sees a way of maximizing profits for their investors. And then the question is, you know, you could, I mean, that's why even uh, if somebody wants government to restrict Microsoft's ability to pry into my life, is that from the left or the right? I mean, it could mm. be both. It could be either one. Yeah, because now it's big government. I mean, it's big business as well as big government. Big tech. <laughs> big, big tech, tech yeah. is the big word, yeah. right? True. Like, yeah, because yeah. like, because like, I'm, I'm just thinking within 
kind of my lifetime or somewhat of my lifetime, you know, like there's the expansion of government has grown and I'm just thinking like, okay, OSHA, EPA, even like the Department of Homeland Security, you know, <laughs> like those are just three big right. governmental organizations that have grown that could, some could, could, you know, see as you know, infringing upon their liberties of in some form or fashion, you know, do I have to take off my shoes, you know, I like to go on a plane, you know, so um, it, 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 it seems as if like, in, in my opinion, it seems like government's grown faster than, you know, the individual liberties we've had, or where our individual liberties have grown, there's a roadblock now that's been created by the government. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know. I, 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 I don't, I don't disagree. It, it's a huge question. You'd have to, I mean, if you wanted to do it seriously, you'd have to quantify all sorts of stuff. Um, it seems to me, I don't know whether, I mean, part of this, a big chunk of this is technological change since the 1990s. So the story, the viewpoint today at 2021, things look really different than they did 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And, now, in the 1990s, we were have, there were big, just big arguments between the left and right. It was about stuff like welfare spending. Okay? And we kind of have that today, but not as much, partly because Bill Clinton kind of pushed welfare off the agenda with his welfare reform. Um, but questions about, like, privacy – weren't so big then for technological reasons. Now they're much bigger. Yeah. And then, um, so, I mean, the question is always, uh, to what extent is the political community, and it could be local, countywide, you know, statewide nation, because we have a federalist system here where states can do different things. Um, to what extent is the political community justified in any particular case of interfering with the freedom of individual agents, especially yeah. economic agents, for what, the sake of society itself or large groups of it? And it's certainly justified in doing that sometimes. And it's yes. certainly not justified in doing it all the time. <laughs> so, I mean, that's how I look, especially in this country, <clears throat> which this country has this strong, even though it took a while to apply it to everybody, but this strong notion, individual liberties. I get to live my own life, make my own choices. We do that for moral, political reasons. And we also have a faith that if everybody does that, the rest of us are going to end up benefiting somehow from the fact that my neighbor figured something new out. And in other words, we're actually going to mm -hmm. benefit. So anyway, we have that tradition, and but it is still always going to require us to make the decision. You know, in the my original case, and this is one reason, I'll, I'll just say it, I'll just to say it. So um, I love libertarians. They're always very smart. They're like, they're like, they cleanse the palate, you know, they, they, in an intellectual discussion, <laughs> in an intellectual discussion, you need somebody to say, you know, to, to, from my point of view, as an intellectual, you need someone to say, why not let the kids starve to death? I mean, that's, somebody, <laughs> I don't want to do it, but I want someone to say it and then an answer to be given because yeah. that's what I do. I'm a philosopher. Mm. So I'm happy with that. In reality, I think, you know, if we lived in a small society in a rural town and the barbarians are coming over the last hill and they're going to kill us all and we all run up to Farmer Brown's farm, which happens to be on a hill, the only place that's defensible. And we say to Farmer Brown, Farmer Brown, we got to set up our defenses inside your perimeter here. And Farmer Brown says, no, you're violating my property rights. You can't do it. And we are smart. And we say, listen, Farmer Brown, you understand, if you don't let us do this, you ain't going to have a farm tomorrow because those people, they're going to take everything. Mm -hmm. And he still says no. 
Well, at some point, I think in almost any society, the the people, they probably, they won't say it this carefully, <laughs> but they'll say something. Look, to for us to have a political community which allows freedom tomorrow, we have to limit your freedom, personal freedom right now. We'll pay you for it. We'll argue about the 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 price that we're going to pay you for it later on for damages. But for right now, we're coming in. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so um, libertarianism is fine as a, to me, as a notion that's, uh, as a view that's always saying, hey, give me a justification for that limit on liberty. Sure. That's fine. But there's, there's no society there's no society that does not ever circumscribe the liberties of individuals for the sake of preservation of the society in a crisis. Kind of like COVID-19 and they say, hey, you got to do all these different uh, things because it's going to spread and kill all these people. And then so we got to shut down churches and we got to do we got to, you know, take them out of the buildings and stuff like that. And then now <clears throat> it's so hard for us to figure out. Yeah. As we're transitioning back into whatever normal is going to look like as we're moving out of this, um, what that's going to mean. And it's 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 going to be interesting to see how it all um, all pans out. And I want to throw you one more question. Sure. And it's a little bit of a hard ball. So we'll just go. But you you're always hitting you're batting a thousand. So I think it's going to be fine. <laughs> um, My coach never said that. So anyway, <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> I think, you know, to bring this back to kind of because we always talk about the intersection of religion and politics Mm -hmm. and to bring this back to kind of this, the core of our show. And we're thinking about like the like the religion and, of course, all the different arguments that have happened and so many different conservatives, like where even this COVID-19 has been so politicized where it's like you're either a conservative and believe don't think it exists or think the government's using it as a conspiracy to. Um, you know, you have a conspiracy that the government is using it to tramp down your rights so they can do whatever. Or on the other side, you feel like you're a liberal and you wear masks and you trust that Dr. Fauci with your baby and you would just like give it, you know, like he couldn't do any wrong or whatever. Um, I, I'm exaggerating. But as we're looking at this and as you see us moving Not out really. of this, <laughs> um, as, as we're moving out of this COVID-19 and you know, there's going to be another pandemic at some point. That's what everyone's saying. And we're trying, we're moving into a new, new normal. What do you think, like, what do you think the tensions surrounding religious freedom in our society, like an individual, or maybe I say religious freedom as a specific individual right. Um, what do you see the tensions? What do you like just, and, and again, we're not going to hold you to that, but just like wondering, like, what are the, what are the tensions that you can see either amplified that are there now um, that we're moving forward or something you can maybe imagine as we're moving forward, like how, what's our society going to do and how, what do we need to do maybe on a personal level and individual level to help kind of um, navigate this future with which we're going to see the increased tension of government control versus liberty. And I'm specifically thinking religious rights because of all the controversy that, that surrounded that with COVID-19. Right. Um, so, does that question make sense? Do you need me to rephrase well, it? Like, no, it kind of does. But I mean, I, I are you talking about, are you asking about more than um the problem of communal worship in other words right religion yeah that more as a test case for a broader sense of individual right. rights yeah so i mean the see i would say right there's there's a terrible you know, from my point of view, one of the worst things going on right now, or maybe the worst thing going on, I shouldn't say that, but one of the worst, this partisan politicization of everything. In other words, it's not just to say, I disagree with that, but if you say, I disagree or I agree, you're on a team 
and the teams hate each other. That's the assumption. Are you on that team or on that team? There's only two teams. For every issue, there's only two teams somehow. I don't know how that happened. Uh, I mean, there, you know, it's 32 football teams. I mean, you know, there's a lot of different teams out there. But in <laughs> politics, it's now there's only two. And anything you say, you know, the the wine you drink or the beer you drink, that says which side you're on. You know, every anyway. So <laughs> worship in most of the religions I'm familiar with place a premium on communal communal worship. Yes. Premium. In other words, it's not just incidental. Okay. It's not like having a staff meeting, which you could have online. Okay. It's, it's, it's a deeper thing now. Um, Right. Somebody's going to have to figure out and government is going to have the local and national government is going to have to figure out that if this stuff, if something like this happens in the future, there has to be a way for religious communities to worship together. You know, so there's got to be some kind of give where the religious communities say, "Okay, listen, there's certain things we won't do. But one of them is so. We are going to meet in person, but we'll accept some restrictions on how we do it. And at the same time, government agencies and others have to say, okay, we we can live with that. Let's talk about this because this is a necessity. Okay. It would be kind of like saying, it would be kind of like saying, telling, I mean, from the point of view, I don't know, maybe from your point of view. It's kind of like saying, I can't live with my family uh, because of a disease. Mm. Now, I'm willing to do that for a couple of weeks if somebody's got a terrible disease, but I'm not willing to do it long term. Um, And so that's it. I mean, I suppose that's a question of figuring stuff out. That's not necessarily a political issue. It becomes political. If people on each side, the religious community side and the regulatory agency side, if they think of each other as political opponents, Hmm. as different kinds of people, like, for example, if you got religious communities and then a largely secular, (laughs) non-religious authority that thinks, well, just do it on Zoom. Like I do my staff meetings, mm-hmm. right? Right. And that's like, no. Okay. You, you, that's not quite, you don't under, you're not trying to understand us and how we live. Um, then it becomes a political issue. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, so I don't, and I don't know, but I think smart people, in the community and smart people res- who have responsibility for regulation have got to know each other and talk to each other and figure it out. Uh, in other words, what you can't have, I mean, bureaucracy worse, works worst when it gets no information from the people it's regulating. Hmm. Right? Yeah. I mean, that's the... You know, it's really good. No, I mean, but that's preach. That's that's you know, that's how like I mean, uh, I'm teaching right now uh, and I've been teaching. I mean, I've been teaching in person. I, I was on sabbatical last fall, last spring when it started. Students were all sent home. So like everybody else, I taught the rest of the spring semester on uh, remotely. OK. Uh, this past fall, it just so happened by f- luck that I happened to be on leave on sabbatical. And uh, all the teaching, students came back, but all the teaching was remote. In other words, the students are sitting in their dorm rooms online. Mm-hmm. Then this semester, they asked, well, it's up to faculty. You can teach online. You can teach in person. I, of course, wanted to teach in person. Um I mean, I look, I'm careful 
I don't want to get sick. I don't want my family to get sick, but I don't spend a lot of time of hugging. But I don't let a lot of spend a lot of time hugging students, and I I I don't. I mean, it's rare because it's not a religious community. It's a little different. So, um, yes. You know, the point is, I, I, you know, if I'm careful, I'm not, I'm going to be fine, and they're going to be fine anyway. But the point is now, in the semester up, the the number of cases have gone up, gone down, gone up and down. The school is, of course everybody's afraid of bad publicity. Everybody's trying. They yes. Nobody wants their institution to be marked as an institution which has failed in the management mm. of COVID. Yeah. And the result is this, well, it, anyway, I hope and pray that someday people will kind of figure this out to deal with this without paranoia or politicization. Mm, yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, to, to, to your point, um, when you mentioned that, you know, we're, we're so sort of divided kind of in our camps, um, politically and otherwise, you know, I mean, it's just like Josh and I, so Josh and I, up, like are in different camps, like I tend to lean more liberal, Josh tends to lean more conservative, you know, but we don't let those differences necessarily interfere with, like, just our, our relationship. And there's there's a really good book, and I mentioned it several times in this show, just because I think it's so good. It's and it's called uh, "Why We Are Polarized" by Ezra Klein, and in the book he oh, talks Ezra about, Klein. yeah, right. he, he he talks about sort of like how political identities have become, or he talks about in sort of the age of identity politics, how um, our political affiliations have become like a mega identity, where you know if someone says they're a Democrat you know, people just automatically assume what, where they shop to get their food, you know, like what kind of music they listen to. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Trader Joe's, you know, like they're listening to Dave Matthews, you know, and <laughs> like, and, and they don't take showers often, you know, and, um, <laughs> you know, like in, and conservative, like if, if someone says they're Republican or like, okay, well, that, know that. <laughs> I didn't know right. that. Okay, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> and, uh, I didn't uh, know that. <laughs> a Republican, you know, it's like, okay, well, they're, they're obviously a member of the NRA, you know, they, they racist. Yeah. They attended the stop the steal rally, you know, like they're racist, you know, and, and it's just like our, our political affiliations have become like a, such a mega identity that people almost don't want to get to know each other anymore, short of what political affiliation they are. And like, so, so I, I think you, you really kind of, you know, hit the nail on the head, um, you know, describing that and just sort of your, your observation of that. But, um, but anyways, um, we just want to thank you, uh, professor yeah, for, you. for coming on to sh coming on the show. Uh, thank you for giving us some of your time. Um, from what I'm hearing from you is, when politicians are, t are using terms like socialism, fascism, communism, we should just ignore them because they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> Is that a good synopsis? I think, I think that's a perfectly good, I would say, in this country. It's not true everywhere else. Mm -hmm. sure. I mean, I don't, I, I don't want to drone on, but right, in, in France, in Germany, in Holland, in a lot of those countries – there were sizable but small communist parties all through the second half of the 20th century and socialist parties. Mm -hmm. There is there's is no history in America of a really sizable, right? There is, I mean, you, it's, you, you need a microscope to find them. Americans are in fact <laughs> far more centrist than they believe about themselves. Anyway. Mm. Wow. Okay, I, I'm done. That's awesome. Well, you that's, heard, you heard it here, folks. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again, um, and thank you to our listeners. And uh, yeah, we will uh, talk to everybody and see everybody next week. Thanks, thanks thank guys. You. God bless. Bye. It's been a real pleasure.